going to talk about meditating on the ego. And it's going to be more than just, uh, more than just you know, talking about it, but have an actual step-by-step -step process of an actual meditative process that we use to meditate on the ego. So it should be a little informative that way. So, let's see. Basically, don't hate meditate. That's really funny. <laughs> Just throw that on there. Don't really <laughs> meditate. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. That I like that a lot. Yeah. So we got a Samael yeah. on board quote here. Those that do not know how to meditate, the superficial, the ignorant, will never be able to dissolve the ego. They will always be driftwood in the tumultuous sea of life. So this is a, this is one of the biggest concepts we have. This is the death, right? Of the three factors, this is the death factor. The death of the ego. So, I'm going to talk a little bit briefly about meditation. So, meditation is the fundamental. Me meditation is fundamental when we sincerely yearn for a change. When you really want to change, we have to meditate. The didactic material for meditation is found precisely in the different events and daily circumstances of everyday life. The didactic, right? The the core of what we're going to meditate on. People always complain about unpleasant events. We all do it. We've all done it for a long time. But these, ev these events provide useful elements for our spiritual growth. Yeah. Defects discovered in the field of everyday life must be understood profoundly through the technique of meditation. Meditating on these events allows us to savor the event and its outcome within ourselves. So it's really important that we start to have a conscious shift now from these unpleasant events that always occur, all the stuff that bothers us, we have to start detaching ourselves from it with self-observation, but at the same time observing it using self-observation and depth and motion. So we have to try not to get fascinated and identified with it, but at the same time stop enough to realize what's going on. Um, the Gnostics that desire to escape their workplace, their town, or their family position to take refuge in the forest with the intention of self-liberation are like silly children who play hooky from school. It can't be done. You can't liberate yourself from the ego if you're, you know, hibernating in a cave or living like a hermit. If you're not faced with it every day, it's not overcoming it. You're not going to comprehend it by running away from it. The difficult psychological gymnasiums in the home, on the street, or at, the work, or at work always offer the best <coughs> opportunities for self-discovery. In these interrelationships, the multiple defects we carry inside always emerge naturally and spontaneously. You don't have to wait for an ego to come by. It's going to come by when you're you know, at work or say if, when I'm driving here today and they got York Street closed down. I'm driving through downtown and there's a Knights game or something going on. Like, oh man, there's the ego. You don't, you, don't have to, you don't have to go into a cave and try and find your ego. It'll find you if you're out there. And like, this is the, yeah. 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 You can't get away from it. Or your family. <laughs> yeah, yeah, family situations for sure. Work for everybody. Nobody likes work, right? So, same thing. Um, if we are vigilant, we can see and discover the egos as they're occurring, like we're talking about. This, this is like self-observation. We really have to, for, for this stuff, and I think I mentioned it later, it has to be done simultaneously with self-observation and death and motion. But everybody remembers what death and motion is? Anybody want to say? Put the hand up. Front row. From moment to moment to uh, kill the ego. Kill the ego, yeah. Yeah, to expand on it more, it's the idea of as soon as you notice an, e an ego come up or flare up, you pray instantly to your Divine Mother to, to eliminate that ego. And at the same time, that offers you a self-observation, because now you said, okay, I got mad in the car, Divine Mother, please you know, take this ego from me, or however you want to pray to your own Divine Mother. And at the same time, you should be compartmentalizing that. Okay, this happened. Later in meditation, when I do this technique that I'm going to show you, I'm going to bring that back and relive that with the conscious imagination that we talked about and see, you know, kind of dissect it, that kind of thing. Yeah. And the self-observation is obviously trying to be more detached and watching yourself. You can ground yourself through self-awareness, you know, the breath, not getting caught up and watching, being on guard for the ego, basically. So the unpleasant event from daily life must be reconstructed through conscious imagination by means of the techniques of meditation. I remember we talked about conscious imagination a little bit while I was kind of aloof with it. I'm like, oh, it's like when you kind of, you know, think of your heart tempo and you're pitching it in your mind, you're consciously using your imagination instead of letting yourself be carried away by fantasies or daydreams. But uh, this is where conscious imagination comes into, com comes into play big time when we do this kind of meditative technique that we're going to get to. 
So the reconstruction allows us to verify for ourselves the various eyes participating in the event. Because although we're watching probably one eagle, you're going to see that there's multiple eagles in action. And the first one you see is probably not the main eagle that's causing it either. The first may be anger. You know, I got angry. Why did you get angry? Because somebody was insulting me and I have an over, you know, inflated sense of the self and all this pride. So now you have the ego of pride and the ego of anger. And there's always, there's always more than that. It's always multifaceted that way. Oh, there we go. Any defect is multifaceted and has diverse links and roots that must be studied. So this is the idea. That's why we relive it. In-depth comprehension is impossible without the practice of meditation. You're not going to be able to just, through your daily life, be like, oh, I got mad. Yeah, it's because of this. Okay, then go on with your life. You know, you kind of got to go to meditation. You kind of got to go deeper if you really want to understand what's going on. We must recognize our own mistakes without self-justification, without excuses, and without evasion. So this is, this is an easier thing to say and a harder thing to do because we always want to justify why our actions. We've talked about this before. We always want to justify it or make excuses for ourselves. Our ego is always like, well, I did that, but it's because of this, you know, because uh, I got into a fight, but someone made fun of my girlfriend, so I was kind of perfect, protecting her honor. Were you or were you looking for, for an out for your anger? You know, you always got to gotta get further, go further, and you can't, you can't justify the ego, and you, and you can't be afraid of it. You can't be afraid of, you know, diving into it. Sometimes we, in our thoughts, we have, people have, like, thoughts that are like, you wouldn't, you would never act on these thoughts or, you, you, or their thoughts are just, you know, morbid sometimes. And these people have these, and it's the ego. But we can't say, okay, well, that thought's too intense. It's just not something I have. It's like, let's study it. Where is it coming from? And let's eliminate it, you know? Anything you try to avoid, you're not eliminating. It's going to come back, like we said. That's why you can't hide in a cave. So a discovered psychological defect must be completely comprehended in the various recesses of the mind. So you really have to comprehend it. So there is a lot of meditative work. I mean, we can start, we start with the roots, the smaller ones, that's easier, but then we can slowly, slowly, slowly go to the bigger ones. There's an analogy of a, of a beehive with this big, massive queen bee floating around, and you're like, ah, oh, and, and all these bees flying around, and you're like, oh man, I just want to kill that big bee because she's stinging everybody. But you realize you got to kill the little bees that are feeding her first. You've got to start swatting the little bees, and then the, the, the big bee will get smaller and then die. So to say, you know, oh, okay, I want to not have lust anymore. I'm going to attack the ego of lust. Like, well, there's a lot of roots. There's a lot of factors. It manifests in a lot of different ways. You're going to have to start with the most obvious ones and the easiest ones first, because you're not just going to say one night, meditate, no more lust. Next, let's get to the other six deadly sins or whatever, because right? they all have roots. They all have roots. So you got to start cutting off the roots before you get to the trunk. As we make use of the sense of psychological observation, it will develop marvelously. Marvelously. This is another thing that someone else says. It's hard at first to observe ourselves, and we always get caught up and fascinated and fall asleep in our day. But the more we practice self-observation, the easier it becomes, and the more in tune we are with observing ourselves. So although it seems like a big task at first, you just start. Start with five minutes a day of observing or trying to be in awareness, and then ten, and then, and then sooner or later it would become more natural to try and just do it th throughout the day, and then all day, you know, like this is pretty intense, all day, and then self-remembering, it all comes from, but you got to start with baby steps. And the self-remembering, uh, just go back and... Self, yeah, self-remembering is, is the hardest one of, of this, you know, self-awareness, self-observation, and self-remembering. Self-remembering is like, almost like a permanent meditation only throughout your whole, your entire day, you, you never associate with the ego. You're always remembering the being, the Divine Mother, the Father who's in secret, kind of in constant connection with them. It's kind of like spending an entire day without falling into fascination with one ego or another. And it's advanced because there's so many egos that we're working on. Right? So, but it, it, it is one of the major processes. If you want to think of it, self-awareness, ground yourself by your senses so you're not daydreaming. Then self-observation, observe what's going on, what's happening. Is there an ego manifesting? What's causing this ego to manifest? And after a while, through elimination, you can start doing, um, start permanently self-remembering. So, yeah, we will then be able to perceive the eyes during meditation. As, as our self-observation and psychological observation increases and becomes better and we use it more, our meditations will, will become better and deeper. We'll, we'll get used to looking for egos in our daily life and trying to comprehend them more. And then it'll be easier for us to sit down and meditate and say, okay, instead of it's like, 
instead of saying, oh, where is an ego I could work on the day? It's going to be like, which one? There are so many. Which one should I do? You know, that kind of thing. So any group of eyes which take part in this or that drama, comedy, or tragedy of everyday life, after having been totally understood, must be eliminated through the power of the Divine Mother Kundalini. And this is what we're talking about tonight. It is only the Divine Mother that can eliminate the egos. So once the defect is comprehended, it must be reduced to ashes. There's a lot of comprehension work. There's a lot of meditating on the ego, and then we have to supplicate the Divine Mother to the Divine Mother to eliminate this for us. So Samael is really urgent in saying, alone or in the ninth sphere, one must work upon the ego. Doesn't matter if you have a partner, if you don't have to, if you don't have a partner, you have to work on the ego. It's the fundamental, it's the fundamental of, of Samael's teachings. Even as I mentioned before, uh, when you know students would he has the question and answer books, and they'd be asking them questions of how do I become clairvoyant or how can I astral project or how can I this? And he says he gets a lot of letters, but very rarely do they say, How do I eliminate ego? Because people even when they're on the path, they still have an internal aversion to try and eliminate the ego because it's so rooted within us so rooted like the, the it's very you know obvious manifestations we want to get rid of but the idea that it goes deeper and deeper and deeper and that we are still attached to our egos and we think the egos are ourselves people uh, always have an aversion to this work because it's because it's difficult but it's most important it doesn't matter if you're working in alchemy or if you're working in meditation you have to work upon the ego basically just driving that home we gotta we gotta self-observe and we gotta meditate on the ego it's, it's the fundamentals. There's no point in building solar bodies if you're full of ego still. I mean, there's a point to do it together and simultaneously. I'm not saying you have to do one or the other, but you have to be working on the ego. Only by eliminating the psychological aggregates of the me, myself, the I, do we establish adequate foundations for correct action in our consciousness. So that's Samael saying that, you know, only by eliminating the ego can we act, truly act properly or be in, in constant connection with our being. It's only through the elimination of the ego. The building of the solar bodies in that helps us eliminate the egos fully at their causal level, but we, there's so much work to do at this level that this is kind of the main crux of the teachings, what we should be doing. The daily practice of meditation transform, transforms us radically. People who do not work on the annihilation of the eye are like butterflies that flutter from one school to another. And we see that a lot, and that's a, why we're even talking today about how, how it's you guys said this class is condensed, you know? Although it's one of the bigger classes we've seen in the face scene, as I've said. You see how you lose people? Because a lot of people want a mantra or something. Give me a mantra that will enlighten me. And then they want something quick and easy, or tell me a prayer that uh, I say this one prayer, then I become liberated. And it doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. The e that's what the ego is looking for, because it can hide behind that. You know? This is too hard, or let's, let's not do this as an easier way. Well, the only way to free yourself from the ego is by observing it and eliminating it. And since the ego doesn't observe itself, that's the only time we're really in connection with our consciousness. It's the essence and the consciousness that's observing the ego. So the more we observe, the more in connection with our consciousness we are. Uh, they have yet to find their permanent center of gravity. Permanent center of gravity is something that I don't know if Lee got into with, with you guys in phase A or B or not, but it's kind of the idea of once you start eliminating ego, there is a personality almost in there that's more centered than all like all these egos we have right now so each one of us as an individual has so many like oh, I want to do this I want to do that I want to do this because we're controlled by ego this is a personality more controlled by the being a permanent center of gravity they die as failures without ever reaching the inner self realization of the being so that's kind of a harsh line that Samuel says but die as failures in the regard that they don't self realize which is He's considered a failure. Is a failure to what Samael is trying to do by getting people to self-realize. If you don't eliminate the ego, you, you can't self-realize. That's the idea. Although it's a big task, it's not hard. The steps. I mean, you know, you gotta do it. But there's steps to do here. Anybody can do it. And even uh, it said that if somebody just took one of Samael's books and just lived that book, and only one book, and lived it every day, they would self-realize because all the information is there you need. But we have to be sincere by, by performing a dissection of our eye with the scalpel of self-criticism. <coughs> Self-criticism is really important. Because we're our, we're our own judge. At the end of the day, no one's going to eliminate our ego for us. We have to do it. And for us to do it, we have to get serious about it. We have to understand that this is my job. I have to do this, and it might not be comfortable, but this is what we have to do. 
It is an absurdity to criticize the errors of others. It is fundamental to discover our own errors and to then disintegrate them on the basis of analysis and profound comprehension. <coughs> so, to criticize the errors in other people is obviously not what we're trying to do at all. But the, it can be helpful, but not to criticize them, but if you notice the errors of someone else, like, oh, that person's being very rude, well, that error exists within yourself. So instead of criticizing them for it, be like, that's so rude what they're doing over there, cutting in line or something, be like, okay, think to the times, have I cut in line? Have I done something like this? So this exists in me, let's work on this and try and eliminate that from myself. Kind of the idea is, like, yeah. Well, wasn't that first quote by uh, Samuel like, criticizing errors of others? Because he's saying, look at those ignorant people and, like, you know. <laughs> well, I, well, I don't know if it's, if it's a, it, I mean, it has a negative well, connotation. Know, but, but as soon as I read it, I thought, because I was just reading a book like that, and they said, yeah. like, it's bad karma to be judgmental sure. of others. And, sure. And, um, and it is. And it is. And so when I first, when that first quote came up on mm -hmm. the screen tonight, I thought, well, that's <laughs> being judgmental. Sure. He's judgmental, but I mean, he he's saying ignorant because they're not working on themselves, so I don't know. Uh, they're ignorant of their higher being. It's more like cut and dry fact with him. It's not saying, ah, oh, they're ignorant because they're not down with what I'm saying. It's like they're ignorant to themselves. They don't know themselves. Yeah. yeah. So it could be seen that way. And some of the stuff, some of the stuff in his more psychological stuff seems harsh, but you have to cut through the ego. You have to cut and dry because there's not going to be a, okay, we're going to ride this rainbow to self-realization and we're all going to be happy and holding hands, but... There is a lot of psychological work we have to do on ourselves. So I understand what you're saying there. Like the well, it just seems like it's kind of being proud that, you know, we're better, they're, they're ignorant, mm -hmm. they don't know, and they uh, are doing the right things. I don't know. <laughs> well, I think from what he's trying to say is that they're basically ignorant to yeah. themselves. Mm -hmm. And the superficial are the ones who are attached to the material world, and they aren't going to self-realize. And whether it's, a, I don't know if it's, it, to him, I don't think it's a judgment so much as a fact. That's what I keep telling my mother. She says, you're always, I say, I'm not criticizing, I'm just stating facts. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's exactly what I say. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 I, I, yeah. I know a guy like that, too. That's that's a good good way. Way. Yeah. He's like, I always, I always shoot in the hip, and I always tell it like it is. And at the same time, it's like, maybe there's more ego within that guy, and his idea is that he's what it is. is it's like, maybe there's more ego within that guy, and his idea of what it is is a little more egoistic than, say, somebody else who's delved deep into these kind of studies. I mean, you say, I always tell the truth. It's like, no, you always tell your opinion of the truth, which is more like your beliefs, right? Through that kind of thing. But, so now we're going to talk about meditating on the ego specifically. And these are the steps. There's going to be an in-depth version and then a more condensed version. And I do this meditation a lot, too, and I do more of the condensed version. She said this one's really specific so we can get into exactly what we're supposed to be doing. So there's eight steps of meditating on the ego. They are relaxation, retrospection, serene reflection, psychoanalysis, montrealization or koans, you guys remember the koans, superlative analysis, self-judgment, and prayer. And now we're going to go through and we'll talk about each one in order. So first we'll talk about relaxation. It is indispensable to relax the body for meditation. No muscle should remain in tension. It is urgent to provoke and to regulate drowsiness at will. The wise combination of drowsiness and meditation will result in that which is called illumination. This is from Sam Lionel. This is the same with the idea of astral projection, the idea of the in-between the sleep and awake. We have to become drowsiness. We, can't, we have to have no muscle in tension because you can't be fixated on the body when you're going psychologically. So if you're not comfortable, you already have a barrier. You already have something working against you. If you're not relaxed, if you've got you know, pain in the neck or you're fidgety, and you're, you're not going to be able to get into a deep enough state of meditation because you're going to be too connected with your physical body. Is, is the only, like, uh, obviously it says here that drowsiness is key. Mm -hmm. um, are there meditations where drowsiness is not uh, required? Like it's, it's better to not be drowsy, like to be uh, trying to remain almost completely awake as possible. Or focused, yeah. 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 Uh, well, like, focus. If you're working on, if you want to work on <laughs> modularizations for specific chakras, <laughs> for awakening the chakras, okay. but I mean... So it really depends you know, on what yeah, your yeah. aim of the what practice is. is. Yeah, if you want to go psychologically, you want to get the ego, you have to be drowsy because you can't be connected to your physical body. 
I mean, because then, then you'll just be too fixated on the egos of the physical body. Like, oh, I've got an itch in my knee, or the, this is the ego manifesting in the physical. Right. Right? Okay. Right. So th this this is all directly to do with meditating on the ego. So I'm sure there there are there are other practices, but relating to the ego, you want to be a little drowsy. And this is more like uh, more of the beginners, like how to start off. Right. You want to get drowsy and this kind of stuff. But someone like Samael would be able to astral project at will. He doesn't have to try and get drowsy. He would he would give you know, lectures, then he would go into the astral and come back and talk more, and he could do it at will. And once you have these solar bodies, that's the idea, that's what you can do. But while we're building in the building process, I mean, there's, there's more we have to do because we have these lunar bodies, and this is part of it. So, probably no questions on that. Either. But yeah. the thing is, if I'm drowsy, I can't focus, and then I fall <laughs> asleep. Yeah, me too. The idea is what you're trying what we're trying to do is separate <laughs> basically separate the consciousness from the physical body. And you can't you can't like you won't be able to astral project if you don't let your physical body sleep. So when you want to astral project you have to have your, phys your physical body sleep at will. Remaining conscious or else your you know your consciousness is gonna That's fall asleep too. Yeah. That's difficult. Yeah. That's what the practice of focus and concentration is all about. That's what these meditations that's what the whole idea of meditation is. Whether you're working on a mantra for your chakras or whatever, the main key thing that's also working at the same time is you're working on, on your concentration. So though you could have the benefits of, say, working on a specific chakra and get it rotating and then maybe feeling the vibrations and effect of it. The secondary, but which is actually the primary thing you're doing, is working on your concentration. Yeah, so, then, uh, so then what's described the process would be um, first concentration, and then drowsiness. Mm -hmm. is, is that the idea? So, sure. so one should not try to meditate with drowsiness until they're able to retain their concentration past that drowsiness. Is right. that the idea? Yeah, and, and the drowsiness we're referring to is the drowsiness of the body. We're never referring to the drowsiness of the mind. We don't want to start like nodding off into dreams because that's yeah. exactly the opposite of what we're trying to do. We just need the physical body to sleep. So sometimes we do complete breaths and that helps with that too. <coughs> And all the and the mantras give us a focal like a point to focus on while our bo body's falling asleep too. It's kind of the main idea. And then number two we'll do get into is called retrospection. So the objective of retrospection is to become aware of one's behaviors or actions of the past. Um, do not put objects to the mind, objections to the mind. Do not put objections to the mind, kind of thing. So kind of thinking about the day, but you don't want to be like, ah, no, I didn't have that here. I don't want to think about that part because I was kind of mean, you know. You have to recall memories of the past. Study each memory without becoming identified with it. So this is where it gets kind of tricky. You want to study the memory, but you don't want to get identified with it where you become wrapped up and start reliving it like in a dream state. You want to be able to sort of consciously observe that memory without being like, well, yeah, I remember I got mad because this guy said something to me. Oh, God, that made me mad. You know, get, get all back into identifying with it. You want to be like, I got mad because of this guy, whatever, made fun of my sweater. And then they realize, oh, hey, okay, there's ego stuff going on here. It's my pride ego or whatever. You know, you want to stay, you want to observe it and stay detached from it. So it's kind of a double-edged sword, which sounds tricky at first. But if you understand that, we could always, always spend our, our minds, you know, in the future or in the past. So if we say... Yeah, somebody made fun of me, and then you start physically being like, oh, man, I can't believe it. And you get mad again, and you're reliving it, and you're carrying it with you now. Yeah. So we want to observe it without reliving it, without becoming identified with it. You have to stay objective. You have to stay objective. That is and key. Get your emotions out of the way. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Get the emotions out. Get the egos out. So due to the mechanical life he lives, the intellectual animal forgets the self. Almost constantly. Almost constantly. Always forgetting the higher nature, always forgetting the divine mother and the you know father who's in secret. Always even forgetting what essence of stuff and just getting wrapped up with ego. So good, coming to stuff like this is really good because now it's more conducive to okay, we're going to focus on this and we're going to talk about it. It's easier to uh, keep it in check when we're you know here at the Gnostic Center, but when you go into real life, it's when it becomes much more difficult. It becomes much more difficult because of our mechanical nature that we we. Used we forget all this stuff and fall into fascination. We become fascinated with our emotions and our egos and the dramas and tragedies that are going on in our life. Just get all wrapped up with it and then be like, okay, well, it's Wednesday. Okay, no ego today. Good. And then fall back into it, you know. It happens to all of us. After that, we do serene reflection. So first, before any thoughts surge, we must become fully aware of the mood we're in. It's kind of like a, you know, you got to check yourself. 
We have to serenely observe the mind. So we just we just recall stuff from the past, but now we have to be aware of the mood. We have to pay full attention to any mental form which appears. We must be centuries of our own mind during any given agitated activity. So this is basically saying, if we're recalling stuff from the past, we're becoming aware of our mood so we're not getting attached to it. Now as all this, all these agitations start coming up, like, oh, remember this? We have to be centuries. We have to be guardians. We're like, hey, yeah, remember that? It happened like this. We have to observe it and not get wrapped up in it. Especially when we first start the meditation, because, you know, as soon as you close your eyes and meditate, it's just bam, bam, bam. You're just getting pounded with pictures from, your, from the entire day or from the past, and you really have to take a moment to, to clear your mind. This is what the serene reflection is basically about. Then we must stop for an instant and observe it. So the idea is not something pops up from the day. Don't, don't identify with it. Just don't, don't let it affect you. Just It pops up, okay, now it's gone. And now take a second and say, okay, what was that? What happened there? What ego was at play there? That kind of thing. So you can't be, you can't jump right into it, you know? You have to guard your mind against becoming identified and fascinated with it, and then you stop for an instant and observe it. And it's, it's, a, it's, a dangerous, it's a dangerous thing to be doing, because then as you observe it, you could start reliving it and fall into fascination and identification and sleep. So it does take a lot of practice, this kind of meditation. This is kind of a more like a mentally fatiguing meditation. There's some we do that are more relaxing. If you want to do the oh, the Divine Mother and feeling the Divine Mother, it's, it's relaxing. But this is more like rigorous psychological work, but you work up to it. And uh, it becomes quite beneficial. So then the fourth step is psychoanalysis. We examine, evaluate, and inquire about each mental form as they, em they emerge from within the mind. Some of this stuff might be more advanced, because it might be you have a million things flash in front of your mind. You're not going to get to the root of every single one of them. You want it to calm down. You're not attached to it. Now we can start to examine and evaluate, evaluate the mental forms that, are, that we're seeing in front of us. We can start finding out the origin, root cause, reason, or fundamental motive for each thought that we have, each memory or affection or emotion, feeling, resentment, or image as it emerges from the bottom of the subconsciousness. So basically, the la from, from the last one, we're kind of clearing our minds. We're not becoming attached to anything, and now, now maybe it's a little more slower. We have this mental image come up, maybe a thought or a feeling, and we can, we can kind of tra trace it back. Okay, I have this thought. Why am I thinking this? Oh, because of... And we can start, you know. This is more individual work, because we're, we're going to do a group meditation guided with this, but it's going to be more internal, because obviously everyone's going to be working on their own egos. They're going to have their own things come up. But uh, once we get to that point, we start, you know, we take it down and figure out what's going on. But basically, this whole, that whole process up to here, we're calming the mind down, getting ready for the meditation. That's kind of like the warm-up, basically. Because now we're going to get into a, man, a mantralization or a koan. So, I mean, I've been a big fan of mantralizations. Koans I've used from time to time. But they don't resonate as well with me, but they might with others. My little brother, I know, loves them. He's always talking, okay, his hand... And, you know, you got the skin, muscle, tissue, nerves, cells, atoms, taking the smaller and smaller until you can't think of anything smaller. And then it's a way of, it's a way of kind of tiring out the ego because you're really focused now. You're really focusing on something. You can do it with anything like the, the uh, chicken and the egg one. That one's more frustrating for me than anything. Chicken and egg, chicken and egg, chicken and egg, chicken and egg. I don't know. <laughs> but, but, but it's just a way of wearing out your mind. But, the the martialization is also are really good for focusing. And the objective of this part is to mix the magical forces of mantras or koans in our inner universe. The magical forces, because this, this will awaken consciousness. Internally accumulate crystic atoms of high voltage, which is what, was what they really do esoterically. More like exoterically, they, they control the mind. The mantras or koans control the mind because now you're Focusing the energy of the mind, you're using it, you're, you got it sharpened now, you're doing a mantra that you're totally focused on, or you're thinking about these colons, the tree falling, the wood, the one hand clapping, or you've got a mantra. So now these thoughts aren't surging in your mind anymore, because you see we've, we've got away from that now. We eliminated that with the first half, and now we're trying to control or sharpen the mind with a mantra or a colon. So in this psychological work, the mind must assume a, a receptive, tranquil, and profound state. We have to start becoming 
really receptive and really tra tranquil, really peaceful. We don't want any more of the images popping up and it's okay, where did this thought come from? Trace it back, trace it back. Okay, now it's sort of gone and now go back into the mantralization, which you can do. I mean, it takes practice, right? It takes practice. But once we do that, we're going to get into superlative, superlative analysis. <clears throat> so the idea is now we've been doing the, the mantra or the koan, and we have our, our minds focused, it's sharpened. We've, uh, you know, we've eliminated the part where memories from the past or feelings are surging on us because we've already eliminated that part. We've gone past that now. And now we do an introspection, introspective knowledge of oneself. During deep meditation, introversion is indispensable. Basically, what all these steps are doing is leading to a deeper and a deeper and a deeper state of meditation. It's just kind of a guided way of doing it. So in this, in this state now, one will work on comprehending the I or defect that one wants to disintegrate. So now we're doing more conscious control. So now we've gone through all of those eight steps. It's not until step six that we bring that ego that we want to work on, that we've observed. So in step six, we say, okay, now you had an idea from the day when you got angry. You're going to bring that up at this point once you're in a receptive state and you got the mind under control. So we concentrate on the eye and maintain it on the screen of, of the mind. So we concentrate on that particular ego. Above all, it is indispensable to be sincere with oneself. And superlative analysis consists of two phases. There's self-exploration and self-discovery. We'll talk different. We'll talk about it. Okay. So, self-exploration. We investigate when that particular eye, we picked an ego now, we want to work on a specific ego. Now we investigate when that ego first manifested in our life. If we can think, or if we can't think of our entire life, then just go for that day, you know what I mean? Or farther back, or you can start with the day, basically, it's easier. And then over time you'll start seeing how far back it goes. Then you can think about when it last manifested in your life, which would probably be the most recent time. And if that's the only time you can think of, then just focus on that time. You can investigate in which moment it had more strength to manifest itself. So what caused it to manifest? What gives it this ego strength? So, I mean, something with, say, anger. If you had a problem with anger, then you can say, well, someone insults me. So obviously it has more strength to manifest itself on being insulted. That kind of thing. We'll be looking at that. Like, what causes this ego to come out is what we want. So if we say well, we're talking about anger, then, you know, Take about anger manifested first in my life. Uh, I can't remember. It's been with me for so long. Last time I can think of a bunch of times. Last time in particular it manifested was this morning. Okay, and then what caused it to manifest? What 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 allowed me to get that way? And then you start analyzing that kind of side of it. Okay, I was insulted, but why why did I become angry? Because my pride was hurt and I made a mistake or I you know misspoke and somebody made fun of my I don't know something. You know, there's so many reasons. And then. Now we got self-discovery. We investigate what are the nourishing foods of that particular eye. So this is more when we get into that side. So anger manifested because someone made fun of me. What nourished this anger? This is because of my pride. They made fun of me, and I don't like being made fun of because I want people to think that I'm awesome all the time. And I want everyone to always be giving me pats on the back. And then we're going to fraction and divide the defect in various parts for study. So this is where we say, okay, this is where we start getting at the different parts of it. Because I had this pride. It manifested into anger when I got made fun of, but I have this pride because I have an you know, overinflated sense of self-worth where I actually think I'm better than other people, so they shouldn't be making fun of me. And now we can start seeing you know, all the different parts of this. So, and then we can see what kind of eye does it originate from. So we can say, say it was anger and it came from the pride of my self-worth. And uh, you know, what kind of eyes originate from it. So, yeah. I was reading... When I read psychology books, they always say most things originate from fear. Sure, yeah. 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 And you could, you could look at that yourself. Maybe, maybe you got mad because you're fear, maybe you got mad because you're afraid of being exposed. Maybe you have a weakness, like uh, maybe you throw like a girl and someone, make, or if you're, <laughs> if you're a guy, I mean, and like being macho. So maybe you just throw snowballs like a girl and someone made fun of you, so you got all mad and you wanted to fight them. It's like, well, oh, because I'm afraid of being outed as someone who can't throw a snowball or something. I mean, these are just random examples I'm coming up with. But you can see what it's like. But we can see now, we look at what kind of eyes originate from it. So the first one was anger, right? So we had anger. Well, what kind of other egos did that anger cause? Well, now I was mean, and I yelled at him and made fun of him or something, and 
maybe we got into a physical fight, so no violence manifested from this anger, or maybe, you know, rage and all this other stuff, or I started hurting people verbally because of it and all this kind of stuff. And then maybe I drove like a maniac and hit a cat, so you can start seeing like what what came from this anger. Something caused it and something happened. Like there's, there's a, a ripple effect going on here. First there's the ego itself, which we know is like an onion. There's more egos beneath it than the outside layer. And then there's like a, a, a wave, in, like you're throwing a pebble in the pond and it waves out. And these, and these all have effects and we can start seeing, okay, so then I came home and I yelled at my wife, but it wasn't mad at her, it was because someone made fun of me, so I did a disservice to her. And we can now see like what's actually happening, how this ego is leading to more egos and snowballing and snowballing and snowballing, and they're all interconnecting. And we start really analyzing that. And then we come to self-judgment. So we seat the I being studied in the defendant's chair. And like when I'm saying this, when I do this, I, I do this literally. And when if I pick, if I want to pick a specific ego, saying like a, like an easy one, like I, I for a long time loved watching hockey fights because I was a big fan of hockey fights. I thought they were awesome, right? So then I go through all this and I, and I think of what, what it would do, and it, it caused me to be like more testosterone and pumped up, and then I want to fight and all this kind of thing. But then when I see this ego in the defendant's chair, it looked just like me, only like this crazy guy who just wanted to fight. So it looks like it really disheveled me, and I can see the effects, and I'm, I'm not digging it, like. I don't want to be like this, and I'm seeing that. And it's this guy just like, you know, like really animalistic. Yeah, that's how I can only describe it because he's like really disheveled, but it's me making a crazy face. But I'm using your conscious imagination to actually put him like in my mind in a courtroom in a defendant's chair. And then what you do is you bring to to judgment the damages that eye causes to the consciousness. You're saying, "Okay, I'm acting like this." What is this doing to my consciousness? Well, obviously it's asleep because I'm wrapped up now in this rage and I just want to watch hockey fights and it makes me want to be more violent than I want to, you know, jersey my brothers or something and all this kind of stuff. The whole time I'm doing this and wrapped up in this and on YouTube watching hockey fights, you're asleep, 100% asleep. Not thinking of the Divine Mother, not thinking of the higher, higher fathers in secret, you know, not even thinking about ego or essence or any of that stuff, just wrapped up. These are the, these are the damages, you're totally separated. And then you judge the benefits that the annihilation of that eye would bring into your life. So what if I didn't say, back in those days, if I didn't spend a half an hour to 45 minutes a day watching hockey fights on TV, what could I do with that, you know? It's a half an hour a day that I'm like becoming more rageful and more angry. So even just not doing that, not watching that would be a benefit. Now if I took that time and say meditated or did something positive, you can see the exact opposite effects of have and how you know, beneficial it would be to not be doing that every day. So you gotta do that. And then you, but the thing is, you have to be totally sincere and self-critical. I remember when I first started doing this, it's hard to envision myself as this crazy guy, and like, you're only seeing that one aspect of yourself, so, but it, it's so negative, you're like, oh my god, I'm not like that, but no, I, I am. I was like that. I saw it happen, it occurred. This is something you have to face. You know, it's almost like, I don't know, it's almost like Luke Skywalker, you know, remember? And he gets the lightsaber and he chops off Darth Vader's mask and it's his own head in there. It's kind of like you have to face this. Is, this is your dark side. You have to face this. You can't be like, oh, no, I, I, I wasn't that bad. Even though in my mind I can see all the stuff that it led to and all the problems it created in my life. You have to really be sincere and be like, okay, well, here I am. That's not pretty. I don't want to be like that, but I don't have to be. And that's what I'm doing right now. I'm understanding that and I'm going to eliminate this, even if it takes more than you know, a year meditating on the same thing, depending on what it is. Like some of the smaller stuff, you, you can get, start cutting off pretty easily. I'm sure just from coming to these classes, a lot of people have, you, 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 know, you watch your conduct more and this kind of stuff. But the real internal stuff, it takes a lot of, there's a lot of meditation involved. And it doesn't mean that if I, so if I, if I did that meditation on that hockey fight guy, which I did, it doesn't mean that I don't have to consciously make an effort not to fall into the trap of watching hockey fights again and getting caught up with it because it's not like we're going to do a meditation and then, okay, that ego's gone. And then another one, on another one, that one's gone. Slowly but surely, we'll start building. We'll start eliminating smaller aspects until we get to the bigger aspects. And as long as we're meditating on them, self, self-observing and practicing death in motion, we'll be making headway. And then we finally come to the, come to the last, the last, the eighth prayer. So now we've, we have the ego. You've seen your crazy little self in the, in the defendant's chair. 
you've judged you know the the negative effects it has the positive effects that would come into your life if you didn't have this ego now it comes time for the actual prayer the actual elimination now we have to supplicate the divine mother kundalini with with much fervor our in, this is our inner individual divine mother everyone has one she is the only one capable of disintegrating uh, I think it's supposed to say our eyes, disintegrating our egos. You have to talk to your Divine Mother with frankness and introvert all the defects that one has. Be totally open internally with all the defects. And you have to talk, talk to your Divine Mother with a real relationship, like a child would talk to their mother. Be frank, be open, be honest, because this part of our being knows this stuff already. But us, you know, praying to her and praying for the elimination of her, Although it seems right now like we're praying to an external thing to eliminate it, this is an internal aspect of ourselves that already knows this stuff, but we have to comprehend it. We have to ask for the elimination. We have to be sincere in our prayers. And then, and then she will disintegrate the eye at its very root over time. So here's the different pictures of the Divine Mother, right? A lot of classic stuff. There's always, you know, Roman Catholicism, there's always the serpent at the feet. This one's good. It's kind of blurry, but she has an actual spear going through a, a serpent with all these different heads, the seven-headed beast. She's actually spearing it. This is from the Hindu tradition. This one, this one's more related to al alchemy, obviously. And there's a, there's a practice that's like pretty much this identical practice, but while while in the, working in the ninth sphere. But this character always represents. See all the heads. That's the heads of the ego, that the divine mother. This is Kali, Kali of the Hindus, but she's basically. The Divine Mother in her destructive nature, which esoterically seems ah, is a scary demon, but no, it's the Divine Mother in her capacity to destroy our egos while we're doing this. And it does, and it's not only in alchemy that it works, but like through this meditative practice, alchemy will help doing this too. You can do this exact practice while working the ninth sphere also. But uh, so the Divine Mother Kundalini, each of us has our own particular individual Divine Mother. We all have our own. There are as many mothers in heaven as there are beings on earth. This is what Samael explicitly says. Also same with fathers, as fathers who in secret. We all have our own being. We each have one. This is a good one too that he says. It's pretty important. It cannot be emphasized enough that the Divine Mother is a variant of our own individual being in the here and now. We have a Divine Mother. She's a part of us. It's more closely connected to us than we can even feel right now. And it's here and it's now. It's not something we say, oh, pray to my Divine Mother, come from somewhere, come down from heaven and help me out. Like you, Your Divine Mother is within, and she's always with you. It's an internal aspect of your being, of your higher being. And it's good to think this way. You know, the, my, the Divine Mother is here and now. So when I'm, like, I use it sometimes if I get caught up and I find myself doing something that's totally egoistic, I think, okay, well, think of your Divine Mother. Think of your Divine Mother. And even though I can't, totally comprehend the vastness of this of this being of this entity inside of me i can think of a picture like this or maybe not as catholic but maybe but the idea of this you know divine being inside of me and then think of sometimes i think hey what if my actual mom knew what i was doing right now and if i'm too ashamed for her to know i'd be way more ashamed for my divine mother to know kind of thing you know just to kind of keep me in check sometimes but the divine mother is a real aspect where we have to acknowledge is within us and it's only this aspect of ourselves that will destroy the egos. It's only through this power. And then in the astral plane, you can see your Divine Mother, and it could even be like an external person in the astral plane, but you got to remember that in the astral plane, the internal becomes externalized. This is a part of your being. So even though we can't, like there's no one right, standing right behind me, this beautiful woman's not here, you have to remember that she's, she's with you. That's kind of the idea of self-remembering that we're talking about too. This idea that we have this aspect of divinity and beauty inside of us, and that we have to live up to it, we have to be, you know, we have to be good children of the mother. Basically, is the idea, which means more than what it does in our superficial society. It means we have to be on the path because she's the one helping us. So, in order to eliminate ego, one needs the divine mother Kundalini. Like we said, just emphasizing it again, we need this power, this Kundalini force, the divine mother. That's that's what eliminates it. Only she can disintegrate any psychological defect, any eye, or any ego. Reiterated again. Um, that's the Hindu tradition again. You can see all the skulls. This one I like a little bit too because if you see the placement of the feet, it kind of thinks of, it reminds me of sort of where the Divine Mother is. The sexual organs, the heart. Kind of you see 
one foot on each. We have the mother in the heart temple and also in the, in the fluids. So the Divine Mother has the power to reduce any eye to ashes. I think we've said this a million times. The mind by itself cannot radically alter any psychological defect. You can't just meditate on it, think about it, and say, okay, I want to change. It, you can't radically alter it. You have to comprehend it. You have to study it. But the elimination, you need the Divine Mother. Comprehension is fundamental, is a fundamental part, but elimination is necessary. So to comprehend it's one thing, to eliminate it's something else. After comprehending a defect, we must submerge ourselves in profound meditation. Imploring, praying, and asking our particular Divine Mother to disintegrate the understood defect. You have to be really sincere, like we really have to cultivate a sense of devotion to our Divine Mother. And even the cultivation of devotion it is a really big step on the on the esoteric path. We have to because devotion automatically we're saying there's something bigger than ourselves, which fundamentally means there's something bigger than our own ego. And this is what we're really trying to break. So if we can be, you know, venerable, whether you're in, I don't know, a Catholic church or a synagogue or a mosque, it doesn't mean you have to cling to the esoteric doctrines, but if you can cultivate veneration, you're automatically saying there's something bigger than myself something that deserves me to be bowing down because the me that's bowing is full of ego. It's my own ego I'm trying to come, I'm trying to rise above here. So this is the precise technique required for the elimination of those undesirable elements that we carry within, this technique that we're talking about. Without this technique, without this procedure, all efforts to dissolve the ego are fruitless, pointless, and absurd. We need the supplication, we need the prayer of the Divine Mother. We need to understand it in meditation, and we need to pray to the Divine Mother for elimination. It's not saying that everything else is pointless if we're not doing that. It's just saying you're not going to eliminate your ego any other way. <coughs> we don't want to, you know, pussyfoot around it or sugarcoat it and say, you know, no, there's a, there's a mantra you can say, and if you just do this mantra every day for half an hour, you'll have no ego. You have to, you have to do this. This is what you have to do to eliminate ego. This is based on Samael's teachings. And here's the meditation overview, which is, which is like sort of a condensed version, which is a little more easier to follow. This is again, we see the, you know, the Divine Mother, the serpent at the feet. It's really common in particularly Roman Catholic tradition because it's retained some more of the esoteric stuff, although it doesn't teach it. Just because it's so old, the symbolism can't help but, but be there. But uh, so the, the quick overview, the one that I would do is absolute relaxation, so you can focus on relaxation. We gotta reach the state of meditation. The idea that we're blanking our minds out from all the thoughts that were surging, right? We had done that part. Then we relive the scene as it occurred, the scene with the ego that manifested. We seek within oneself the problem, which uh, the uh, the ego which caused the problem. So we re relive the scene. I got mad. Seek within myself. The ego was anger. You know, was the outer shell, the inner shell was pride or fear. And then, by observing serenely, we place the eye in the defendant's chair, and then we proceed with the judgment. So that's a big, this is a big point. Understand the ego, right? So we meditate, relive the scene, we seek the ego. Okay, which ego was it? And we can start with the outside ones, or maybe we want to go a bit further and get, get a guy further in there, say, the anger, because my pride was hurt, so let's go for pride. And then look at the pride, try and analyze it, like, like we said before, what, what caused it, what it causes. And then by observing it, we're all already placing it in the defendant's chair. We're already like, we can start to see. We're observing it serenely, we're unattached. We can see this is not a good part. <coughs> we can start judging it. And then, to pray to the Divine Mother Kundalini for the disintegration of the I, the ego. I mean, it's easier to think of it <coughs> as praying to your Divine Mother. Um, we always write as Divine Mother Kundalini to remind us that these two things are connected the kundalini force and the divine mother but uh like say if i'm everybody could be different too i'm not telling you exactly how to do it but if i'm praying I, I always picture like the sort of the divine mother figure i'm not thinking so much as the energetic system that runs up my spine I'm trying to because this symbolism of this divine mother carries more connotation of this loving powerful feminine presence that can destroy this that, that can really help us so i mean we know that the divine mother is connected to are the same as the kundalini and you know and the heart chakra and all that 
So this exercise must be done alongside the practice of self-observation and depth and motion. We mentioned that earlier. So we know self-observation is, is being aware of what's going on and watching from an unattached kind of viewpoint. And depth and motion is what they call hitting the ego as it as it appears, kind of like a you know whack-a-mole, but with a divine mother. As soon as it comes up, pray to the divine mother, it's gone. That's good. Right? It's not yet. <laughs> from, from doing death in motion, you're not really going to eliminate that ego because it'll come back and come back and come back, but you're eliminating as from your day, you're not falling trapped to it, but then you know that this thing kept popping up, now I'm going to meditate on it, go through that meditating on the ego process, go deeper, what's causing this to come up, and then pray to the Divine Mother that way. You know, Self-observation, we see the egos and their effects as they occur and manifest in our daily lives, right? We're watching centuries of our own mind, our guardians. Uh, death emotion is where we pray to the Divine Mother. The instant we perceive uh, an ego manifesting, forget that D, an ego manifesting during our day. Okay. This, this kind of stuff will be on the cumulative test. These eight steps I don't believe are. There, there's, another, there's another lecture you got. It was uh, uh, from Lee, the steps of meditation in general. That one, I think, is on. This is specifically for the ego. But we're going to go over the test. Don't worry about that. We've got lots of time. <laughs> <laughs> so, these two practices allow us to find the egos we must work on during our meditation exercises. Because when, when we're doing death in motion and self-observation, not only are we observing and you know, kind of stopping egos in their tracks, but we're seeing which ones are popping up more and more and more. And everyone will have different ones that affect them more frequently and that kind of thing. So now we, that gives us the idea of what we have to be working on. So There's so many egos we can all just pick at random, but say if anger is manifesting more in your life, start working more on that one because maybe other egos are a little more, you know, a little more reserved in you. You have a better handle on some. Maybe you're not greedy, but you're really angry. So you might want to work on the anger first, you know. So Gnostic meditation sanctuaries are highly beneficial for going deeper into the meditation of the ego. So places like this, it's, it's, it's easier to meditate on the ego because right now we have, you know, till like 9.30, you have this time set aside. And no one's going to be in here bugging you and asking you questions and stuff. We can meditate here. It's really conducive to meditating. Everything we do here is conducive to meditating. Where it becomes harder is when you have to apply it into your daily life, right? So this is kind of like as easy as it gets for meditating because we're trying to make it that way. But from, from you know, coming here and doing the meditations, it starts to gear our thoughts towards comprehending the egos. So we come here and we talk about the egos and now we're going to meditate on the egos. And then when we leave, we're like, okay, yeah, it's more in the back of my mind now. I should be watching egos. And the more we do that, the easier it becomes to start observing ego. This leads to more recognition of the egos during our daily observations. So although it might be hard at first to catch ourselves because we're, we're getting fascinated and we're getting you know, swallowed by the egos, the more we start to do this practice, the more we can, it becomes easier to observe ourselves in our daily lives, it becomes easier to see the egos manifesting in our daily lives because we're, we're using it. It's like lifting weights. You know? The more often you start lifting 5 pounds, now you have to go to 10 pounds because you're getting stronger. It's the same thing with the psychological work. After analyzing the egos, we can become more determined to find and comprehend more egos in our daily lives. Which is basically what we said, but now you're going to get more inspiration when you finally, say, work on an ego, even a small one. And uh, you do the whole steps we did, you had it in the, in the defendant's chair. And then, like another step I do too, which Samuel talks about too, is you can see the, the ego in the defendant's chair, pray to the Divine Mother, and the Divine Mother cuts the head of the ego off. It seems violent, but you don't want to be nice with these egos, right? So, <laughs> yeah, whack them all, sure, get the big hammer out. Yeah. Yeah. But then once you, yeah. and once you feel this and experience this, the idea of this, this ego being destroyed, and you can feel a rush of, say, you know, a little bit more comprehension, a little bit more essence, you'll get inspired to do it more because you feel like this had an actual practical effect that I did and I felt. And then when these, even if you don't totally eliminate this ego, you'll be more on guard for it than you ever were. And every time it pops up, you go, oh, no, no, I had you in a defendant's chair once. We're going to have to take you back there again, kind of thing. And you'll really feel like you're becoming more free slowly and slowly. From the little, from, from the little that I've done, I'm not claiming to be like 
murderer of mass egos or anything. <laughs> Would you but, say that it's like you're kind of separating the ego from yourself? Yeah. Like you're taking yeah. it away. Yeah. It's a separate thing. Yeah. You're ripping it out. Mm -hmm. And even before you totally yeah, eliminate it, you're talking to it. Yeah. As if, you know. Exactly. Because yeah. yeah. you're deep in yeah. meditation, we're using yeah. conscious imagination, so you can physically, well, it wouldn't be physically, but imaginatively yeah, see. see myself as this horrible thing that, like this eagle that wants to watch hockey fights, you can physically picture it and see this guy sitting there and how negative it is and then flopping the head off and then you feel like, hey, that's not part of me or at least it doesn't have as much control over me as it did and mm -hmm. it does feel freeing, it does feel like there's a rush of, I'm accomplishing something, mm -hmm. I'm doing something and it will lead to wanting to do more. But we have to overcome fascination, that's one of the big things. Fascination, identification, sleep kind of thing. You become fascinated by, especially in meditation, get, say you get fascinated with a thought or in real life, get, or like, I mean, like external life, get fascinated with an ego and then identify with it. So, yeah, I feel anger come up and I identify, yeah, I am really mad because of that. And then you fall asleep. And the sleep is consciousness we're talking about. You're now totally run by the ego. The whole idea is we have to overcome fascination. We must not identify with the egos as they manifest. So this is obviously, like, this is what we're, we're aiming for. I'm not saying like tomorrow, don't let any egos grab a hold of you or you're all out, you know, it's not like that. It's a, it's a process that we're gonna go through. But you must observe the egos as they manifest without becoming attached to them. So that's the first step, observing egos. We know we have them already because we're not enlightened. We don't know our divine uh, father, you know, who's in secret. So that means there's egos blocking our way right now. So we know they're there, now we have to work on observing them and seeing them. The negative ones, we always talk about the negative ones are the easiest ones to start with. Then the ones we see as positive are get harder to work with, but mm -hmm. we have to work with them also, yeah. as we've talked about. Yeah, We have to work with our benevolent nature that wants to help everybody. Here's five dollars, please don't drink that away. Sorry for helping you with your drug habit kind of thing, but then I feel so good. Or the idea of the... The Pharisee who, who gives every always donates when he's going in, but he makes a big deal of how much he's donating, <laughs> you know. Or the idea of people who are fasting, they're like, "Oh my God, I'm so hungry, but I'm fasting. Look at me up on the cross here, you know, doing it for <laughs> outward kind of things." A lot of our suffering we do this way too. It's like, "Oh, I'm, you know, I broke my leg. Oh, don't feel bad for me. I'll be okay, you know, like this kind of thing." It's like we have to really watch out for the ego. Is so tricky. It hides itself so, in so many different ways, particularly in the positive ways. We must use these observations as the foundation for our meditations. That's why the observation is so important, as we said. We have to self-observe, or when it comes time to doing this meditative practice, what, what are we going to do? It might be arbitrary. Okay, I'm going to get rid of anger. When did it last appear? I don't really know, but all this work on anger has to be specific. You have to work on specific things or else you're not going to get the results. You have to find the ego in your day. You have to work on that scene where you became angry or whatever it is, lustful or lazy or, or proud. You have to work on those exact scenes because to try and do it generally, you're not going to attack the ego that way because it's just too big and it's too broad. But just say, okay, lust. Anytime I was lustful, I'm just not going to be lustful. I'm going to get rid of lust. It's not going to work. We have to work with specifics first. That's why we self-observe and then do this kind of meditative practice. And we must implore the help of our Divine Mother. We have to really start cultivating that sense of connection with the Divine Mother, however it is. I mean, we show a lot of images of like the Virgin Mary and that kind of thing, but in your own minds or in your whatever works for you, it's this powerful force. So if, it, if she's a dove and that's how you connect with her, then it's a dove, you know, that kind of idea. But as long as we look past the symbolism of of what she looks like to us and get more into what she's doing, eliminating these egos. And the light. Oh, sorry. Okay, you're writing something there? We can go back for a minute. Yeah. You can tell me to stop anytime. I'm going to slow down. But yeah. So, I mean, the idea is that the, the Divine Mother, we're cultivating this because this is a huge part of us. And the more we cultivate a veneration and devotion to her, the, the, the more on the path we're going to be. Because she's basically the first step. The first step is the Divine Mother. And then from there we start eliminating... Once we start eliminating these egos that we've been finding, it becomes easier to find more egos. Because remember, when you're eliminating ego, you're liberating consciousness. And the more consciousness you have, the more power of observation you have, and, and the better vantage point you'll have, because you're not drowning in so many different eyes. 
So it does become easy. Not easy, but easier. Right? It's definitely doable work. So, yeah, perfect. Good segue. We must rescue consciousness. That's, that's, that's the whole goal of doing this. It is not a comfortable way of living where the egos are untouched and one lives in an illusion of peace and tranquility when within oneself dwell awful thoughts, feelings, and actions that one chooses to ignore. So that's kind of a big chunk of words. But what, what we're saying here is it's, it's not an easy path to be meditating on the ego and forcing yourself to look at it, but it's not an easy path to, do, to be ignoring this either. It's not easy to go through your daily life and have all these negative thoughts and emotions kind of tossing you around and, and taking control of your mind all the time. It's harder that way than it is this way. Because this way now you're taking responsibility and you're doing something about it. Where before you're just a victim getting tossed around by passion's grip, wherever it wants to take you. I'd say it's almost harder to do that. Although it seems more natural for us to be more connected with our ego, once we start learning about these higher principles, it's harder to, to become attached to the ego and just let yourself be carried away because now you feel like you're getting further and further away from the goal, from the truth and the light. So it does, and suppression is not comprehension. That's, that's, that's the, we have to comprehend the egos, but by suppressing and just say, okay, I'm just not going to act on it, and every time I get angry, I'm just not going to be angry. That's good for self-observation if you say, I, I got angry, but I didn't act on it. But if you do that forever, you're not going to comprehend it, and you're not going to eliminate it. It's just going to keep on happening that way over and over again. Because there's nothing in evolution that says you have to get rid of the ego, right? There's nothing in evolution that's going to help you. It'll evolve us this far, and then if we don't consciously liberate ourselves from the wheel of samsara, it's back down around and back up for another go. That's the wheel of evolution. That's how it's going to go. And we can keep doing that forever, or we can take our future into our own hands. Without comprehension, elimination is not possible, so we have to comprehend it. Um, it is a... It requires a huge effort to practice these exercises regardless of what is going on outside of oneself in your daily life. It's a big effort. It's, it's hard. It's hard to do this every night or every day or every other day. You know, It's hard, but it has to be done. It is a war one needs to take up within oneself. That's why we say you always got to think of your, you have to be a century of your own mind kind of thing. You, you're, you're in war right now. The war is happening right now. Once you see who's on, who's on this side and who's on that side, you know, okay, it's a war between myself, between my baseness and my higher possibilities. And if you think of it that way and you keep that in mind, you'll always be fighting. And like I say, if you, if you forget that you're in a war, then you're losing. The only time that, that's a good way to look at it. If I don't think I'm at war right now, it's because I'm losing that war. The ego is making me comfortable. I'm falling asleep. Yeah, it's a big thing. Yeah. This is the... Uh, yeah. So, this is the same idea, this, the egos, right? That's the Divine Mother in her destructive capacity to destroy and eliminate the egos in the Hindu tradition. There's a serpent there too at her feet. There always is with these Divine Mother pictures. We need a power superior to the mind, a power capable of auto atomic, atomically disintegrating any eye, a defect which has been discovered and judged. So we need a power above our mind, and we're so identified with our mind that we think that's us, that's all we are. But fortunately, the Divine Mother Kundalini has the power to reduce the psychological aggregates to cosmic dust. We have this power within us. We have to consciously remember that, and we have to venerate and be devoted to it. Okay, again. A son's paradise is found at the feet of his mother. The Prophet Muhammad from the Quran says that. It's, in the, it's basically in every tradition even though a lot of times it's exoteric. This